everybody. This is Matt. I'm the lead pastor of Westminster Baptist Church. Thanks for engaging God's word with us. My prayer for you is that this would be supplemental to your discipleship journey. Uh, if we can connect you with a local church or a discipleship group, uh, please contact us at info at discoverwbc.com. chapter 42 this morning. We're going to work through 43. We're starting a new series called Delight, and the idea is what, what in this world uh, you're facing, the difficulties, struggles, the joys, and the, the hopes, and the um, persecutions, and oppressions, and whatever it is, what in this life are you dealing with today that God is moving towards delight, that He's moving from hell on earth to heaven forever, He's moving from frustration to faith. What in your life right now is God moving you towards joy and delight? And I hope that God will use these psalms to help you move from frustration to faith, from depression to joy. I hope that God will use these psalms in your life to bring you closer to where he has for you. So this morning we're going to look at how in the psalms David lamented and sons of Korah and others lamented in in the psalms. And the reason for doing this is we get to join in with the history of Christianity. We get to join in with saints of old to read what was written uh, many years ago, thousands of years ago, from people like you and me who struggled in life, who had difficulty, faced hurt, faced pain, faced death, faced divorce, faced all the things that we face in this life. And yet in that, they were all open, raw, vulnerable, showed us and, and really opened the curtain to what it looks like to have a healthy relationship with God. And ultimately what it comes down to in these passages is what does it look like to biblically lament? That process of going from frustration to faith, as we'll say and you'll see on the screen, biblical lamenting is the process of turning your frustration towards the world or towards God into faith in God. Moving from frustration to faith. Biblical lamenting is not what many people would say today is lamenting. In our world, what lamenting has become synonymous with is something like whining or complaining, bitterness, and uh, uh, even sometimes uh, envy and greed and jealousy being uh, communicated to others. But that's not biblical lamenting. It's not what we see in Lamentations. It's not what we see through Psalms or even in other passages of the Bible. Instead, faithful biblical lamenting is when we move from frustration to faith with the process of giving it over to God like this. Acknowledge your God. Recognize the issue that you struggle with. Share it with your God. Give it over to your God and trust in His plan. Now, that's different because sharing is different than giving. Sharing information is different than giving it over to God. You can talk about things all day long. You can talk about your house struggles, your financial struggles, your friend struggles. But it's hard to give that to somebody. Here's an example. If you owe a debt or you, uh, um, maybe your house has not been paid off, you can tell anybody about that. You can say, man, I've got this a number left, and it's a lot. I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay it off, but I'm paying it month by month. You can tell them all day long, but that doesn't mean they're going to take it from you, right? That, isn't going to mean, that doesn't mean they're going to pay it for you. Okay, so there's a difference between you sharing with God and you giving it to God. And it might be this morning it's time for some of us through the process of lamenting, to acknowledge that there is a God who cares for you, to recognize the issue that you need to bring to Him, to share it, to vocalize it, but then to give it over because it's a debt that He's willing to take. It's what He took on the cross. He already paid for it. He's willing to take this debt upon Himself. He's willing to take all the suffering upon Himself. As we learned last week, cast all your anxiety on Him for He cares for you. All of it on Him. Every debt that is owned, every pain that has been endured, every pain that has been endured, every suffering that you're experiencing right now can be given over to God, not just shared with Him. And so this morning we're going to work through Psalm 42 through 43, seeing how uh, David, but also others, would lament. Verse 1, As a deer longs for flowing streams, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and appear before God? What does He do right at the beginning? acknowledges who God is. 
That's where it starts. It all starts with acknowledging who your God is. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so he longs for God. When's the last time you opened up like a, um, a conversation with somebody about a struggle you're having and you're just like, I long for my God and I trust my God. He is my God who reigns, yet here's what I struggle with. Like that's the appropriate process that we see in biblical lamenting to recognize, acknowledge who your God is. That's the pain I'm experiencing, but I have a God who's experienced the pain of giving his son over for me because he loves me. And so in that context, I recognize he's still king. I thirst for that God, the living God. That's where it begins, acknowledging who he's God. So look at verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night, while all day long people say to me, where is your God? I remember this as I pour out my heart, how I walked with many, leading the festive procession to the house of God with joyful and thankful shouts. So he brings up his issue. He acknowledges who God is, and then he brings up his issue. He recognizes it for what it is. Now here's the thing. He recognizes it for what it is and calls it out for what it is. It's not like we have to suppress these things down and go like, well, no, surely he didn't cry. Like, no, he's not struggling at all. No, he says, I used to be the faithful one who would lead people into the procession to be with their God, to have joy joy and thanksgiving in front of God. I used to be that guy, and now I'm the guy who cries day and night. You see what I'm saying? Now I'm the guy that cries day and night. Now, uh, uh, kind of a funny example, you guys can shoot, you know, shots fired, it's totally fine, man, throw, throw them all at me, make fun of me, it's okay. Um, here's the thing. Uh, a couple a months, a couple months ago, I don't even remember how long it was. I had to put down my dog. Um, look, I cried for a long time. Okay, I'm just being real with you. You make fun of me. I didn't realize how much I was. I thought, man, it's, he's old. It's time for him to go. You know, uh, all these different things. Dude, I cried like a baby, and I didn't even know I could cry that hard. Uh, even months later, I called. I called. Oh no, I texted one of my good buddies, my neighbor. I said. When, like, when do we have to stop crying before we lose our man card? It's like, can I cry like months after? He's like, dude, I still cry. Because <laughs> he had to put down his dog too. I'm like, all right, I feel a little bit better because he's like super manly dude and everything. And I'm like, okay, I'm all right. My brother-in-law gives me a picture. He has an artist draw a bow like two days ago. I'm like, get that away from me. Gosh, I'm tearing up just talking about it. Ugh. Anyways, but I, w- I think I was like, every time I saw a picture of him, I was crying. And I'm like, man, come on, Matt. Like, but look, some of you are dealing with really difficult things today. I'm not talking about, not, not talking about a dog, though I love Bo in, in Bo's ways. But, man, some of you are dealing with difficult things today. Divorce, death, uh, losing friends, family members, um, losing jobs, financially struggling. You're dealing with really difficult things and you're bringing them in here. And when you bring them in here, this isn't the place for you to suppress those things down. This isn't the place for tears to soak up and dry up. This isn't the place for you to act like everything's together. Rather, it's the place for us to join in with the symphony of Christians for all time who have cried day and night, who have struggled in pain and heartbreak, who have wrestled through a life that is difficult, and who have been clear, my tears have been my food day and night. Look how he continues, verse 5, Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise Him, my Savior and my God. I am deeply depressed, therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and the peaks of Hermon and from Mount uh, Mizar. Look, he says, my soul is dejected, but I put my hope in God. He says, I'm deeply depressed, but I remember God on the mountain. You see, that's biblical lamenting. Biblical lamenting is not, I'm struggling and I'm deeply depressed and it's your fault, God. It's not us cursing God, it's us praising God. And you see what happens here. He's honest and real about what he's struggling with. Tears cover me day and night. I'm deeply depressed. My soul is anguishing, but I hope in you, God. I trust in you, God. I remember what you did, God. That's biblical lamenting. It's the process of going from frustration to faith. Moving from our struggle to praising God. You see, some people think that... Being depressed is a sin, or being anxious is a sin, and all these different things. And the the truth is, it can lead to sin. 
The reality is we are all struggling with hurt right now. Now, I, maybe, maybe you feel like, maybe you're in one of those seasons that's like really good, and maybe you feel like, man, I'm just thriving right now, man. I'm, look, there's seasons in your life where you struggle. There's seasons in your life where it feels like you're thriving. There's things that happen in your life that really never go away. Whatever place you're in right now, that season you're in right now, there's a couple things that are happening. One, either God is working through you to draw other people out of the depression that they're in, the struggle that they're in because of the faithfulness God has done in your life previously. You are on the Mount Hermon and God did something in your life and it's now time for you to share it with somebody else. Or maybe right now you're in a season where you're like, I'm drowning in the pit of this life and I'm struggling and I need somebody to rip me up out of this. That is not the time for you to turn away from God and curse God. As in Job when they told him, man, just sin and curse God and die, man. This isn't the time for you to step into that. Instead, it's the time for you to step into, I'm deeply depressed, but I remember you, God. My soul is dejected, but I'm putting my hope in you, God. And we see it in beautiful illustrations, two different ones in verses 7 and 8. It says, Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your beakers and your billows have swept over me. The Lord will send His faithful love by day. His song will be with me in the night. A prayer to the God of my life. Do you see how different those two are? Listen, listen to this. Think about this. Uh, if, you didn't, if you can, Rachel, will you put up that picture of the Amicalola Falls? I grew up in northeast Georgia, and these are the largest, uh, this is the largest waterfall in north Georgia. And you can't even see how big it truly is because it goes up even further than that. If you're standing at the bottom when you, and you take a picture, you can't even really see the people at the top. Most people have to drive up there. It's such a long journey to get to the top. The waterfall is huge and just keeps going and going and going. And it's loud. The majesty and the power of this waterfall, it's immense. Anybody in here been to uh, Niagara Falls? Yeah, it's amazing, right? I've never been there. We went to things like this. You guys go to those huge ones, right? I can't even imagine. All, all I know is people say this so loud and so powerful. It's like you can't even hear anything. There's so much power in that waterfall right there. Think about how vast and powerful God's grace and mercy is, can, is in your life and can be in your life. You see, most people don't struggle with can God do something. Most people struggle with will God do something. And so it begins with the power of God. I want you to think about the power of God. I want you to think about this. Can God do something? Yes. Will God do something? That's where we land. That's where we're usually at. You see, biblical lamenting begins with us knowing that the tomb is empty. When we all believe that the tomb is empty, here's what we know. God can. That's what we know. When we, when we look at the empty tomb, we know God can. Now the question is, will God? When will God? Where will God? How will God? And it brings up all these questions that are, honestly, they can become so loud in your mind that they cloud out everything else, and you're like, this is all I can process through, and it's, it's racking your brain, and the world is loud around you, and you have to remember this. It says that God is like the roar of a waterfall. Deep calls into deep because it's pressing into the depths of the ocean, the depths of your heart, the depths of your struggle. That's exactly where God's drawing into. And so when you feel that struggle and your pain, you know that God is vast and powerful. His mercy and grace are immense and move over all things in your life. There's nothing He can't cover. There's no depth that's too deep. But then also, it says, The Lord will send His faithful love by day. His song will be with me in the night. A prayer to the God of my life. I think about, I think about this passage and I think, man, this, this isn't modern day Westminster, Maryland when they wrote this. We're talking about the Middle East thousands of years ago. We're talking, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about quiet nights. I'm talking about no cell phones ringing. Amen? I'm talking about no uh, cars honking. I'm talking about no ambulance with their sirens. We're talking about no factories. We're talking about no road construction work. And if you know what I'm talking about when I say this, we're talking about no trains, railroads right beside your house. Never once have I lived in a home that wasn't beside a railroad. I don't know how it happened. Eight houses, unbelievable. You ask my wife, it's crazy. If you've never heard it, listen to 18-wheeler in the middle of the night, go over a bump. That's what Washtenaw Baptist sounds like 24-7 when my wife and I got married. Just ba boom ba boom <laughs> Constantly, day and night. That's not what I'm talking about here, y'all. 
I'm talking about in the stillness of night when it's quiet and you're all alone. What I'm talking about is a lyre being played or a harp being played and a quiet voice singing out the praises to the Lord, prayers to the Lord. And in that moment, God's speaking to you in quiet. You see, God's there for us when it's the, the world is clouding out our mind and everything around you seems like it's twirling and spiraling into to hell on earth and you feel like the chaos around you is too much for you to handle. God's there like a waterfall deep in the deep. But also in the still moments of life when you feel like you're alone, no one's around you, deeply depressed, your heart's in anguish, you feel like there's no one with you, that's exactly when we can remember that God is with us. He says in verse 9, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about in sorrow because of the enemy's oppression? My adversaries taunt me as if crushing my bones, while all day long they say to me, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise Him, my Savior and my God. You see what he did there, right? He basically just repeated what he, he had previously said. It's a poetic feature. He repeats what he previously said and kind of flips it around backwards. And he ends with, why am I so dejected? But I hope in you. Because he did it three times, didn't he? He said, you're my rock. Later he's going to say, you're my refuge. He remembers him on the mountain, hurrah. But he also says that uh, he should place his hope in the Lord. And remember how it opened, right? You're the living God. So he's always recognizing who God is, acknowledging who God is, and then bringing up that issue that's inside of him. But always reminding himself, no, but I'm going to hope in you. And so, you know, it says, I will say to God, my rock. And that's the acknowledgement, right? God, rock. Rock in Hebrew. It's not um, Selah, the one that is about, is, uh, means something like I will lift up or praise or worship in Hebrew. It's, it's the one that's like a uh, cavernous or huge valley that has huge, massive rocks inside of it. Boulders that can't be moved. Now, you might think rocks, those aren't super powerful to us. But take it in the Middle East a couple thousand years ago. What was the most powerful, strong thing in the world? Well, it might not have been rocks. I actually don't know at that time. I wish I could go back to that time and be like, hey guys, what do y'all think the strongest thing is in the world? But I can't. I do know now that we think steel is pretty strong, right? Well, they didn't have that back then. So when they think strong, I'm sure boulders, which for one, they couldn't move them by themselves, but also they were what they used to build massive, strong buildings. When they talk about strength, they usually talk about rocks. Uh, later in, in Psalms, it also speaks to this in Psalm 18 too. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. So we can understand rock is something that is extremely strong. Later in Psalm 31, 3, it also says, For you are my rock and my fortress. You lead and guide me for your name's sake. Same word. So the idea is that rock is somehow affiliated with fortress. It's what builds up the fortress to provide protection for those whom are inside. My God is your refuge, and He is your rock. When I think about rock, and it's an illustration, but uh, what, do you guys, what do you guys think this is? Right? Probably built to be a trash can. Right? Um, but what this is for me is uh, when I got my boat... Uh, I found this in the back of it. It had um, grease for you to put in the, in the wheels. It had fire extinguisher, and it had an air horn in it. It had a couple things like that, right, that you need for your boat. Well, I left it in there. Didn't exactly know what it was for, but a pretty good storage device in the back. But it literally is a trash can. I feel like I should return it to the person, but here yeah, I still have it. Um, I went out on the Chesapeake Bay with my dad, and... For, for starters, um, a bass boat is not built for the Chesapeake Bay. Let that be known. And somebody came up to me and was like, well, I've been out on the Chesapeake Bay. And I was like, no, you've been out on a river. <laughs> uh, there's a difference. No, I'm kidding. But seriously, the Chesapeake Bay, Paul and I went out on a river on Chesapeake Bay. That's okay. Don't go to where the big, huge carriers are. Don't go to where you see things that are things on a boat that are bigger than your boat. It's a good rule of thumb. So I'm out in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. It's about five miles wide. Um, I think they were, they said that they were five foot swells. I don't know. Huge waves. To me, in a bass boat, because a bass boat comes up about that high. You can see my bass boat out there. They, these waves start crashing over my boat. Well, I didn't know a couple things. One, our bilge pump wasn't working. A bilge pump pumps water out of a boat so that you don't sink. Two, we didn't have enough life jackets. 
that's good. Uh, and that's illegal. Um, I apologize. And uh, three, three, uh, uh, when a boat sinks, you need, you need to figure out how to get out of there, right? Nobody can see you when the boats are 100 feet tall around you. So we had no way to get out of the situation. Now, when you ever go on any trip, you ought to have a backup plan. So I didn't have a backup plan. But our only plan was this. The water started coming up out of the boat from underneath it, coming up around our feet. That's when we recognized, oh, we have a problem. (laughs) And my dad's grown up on the lake. He grew up on a river. I mean, he's been in terrible situations, boat accidents, all the stuff. Owned more boats than you can ever imagine, redone them, sold them, all the stuff. My dad knows boats probably, I would argue, better than anybody in this world. But we had a bad bilge pump, and all we had was this trash can. So my dad starts digging up that water. I'm trying to crank the engine. The engine doesn't work, y'all. I've already told this story, but I'm I'm bringing it back up for a reason. Bailing it out. Bailing water out. Bailing water out. Bailing water out. Ultimately, I get the engine cranked. He's bailing water out, breaking his back on this thing. And we get it over to a place where we can calm down. It's being blocked by an island. The wind calms down. And we're just looking at each other like, like we we, should have lost the boat and maybe our lives. And here we are. You know, it's just a trash can to you. But for me, this, saved, this potentially saved my life. And it definitely saved my boat. And so, you know, it's a silly thing for me. I mean, it's kind of silly. It, it does mean a lot to me in, in some ways because it maybe saved my life. But there are things in your life that you're going to have to bring back up in your life. You, you can't forget these things. You gotta, as, the, as the Israelites did, did you've got to build up something to remember. Because it's so easy for us to forget, Amen. It's so easy for us to forget what God did, and when we forget what God did, we don't remember what God can do. And if we don't know what God can do, then how are we going to know what God will do? And so you're going to face a situation in your life, and you're like, I don't believe God can do it, so I definitely don't believe God will do it. Look, if you're going to, here's what you got to know. Three things. God can do it, God has done it, and God will do it. And if you can remember that has done it part, It'll help you with the can and will. And it's those rocks, it's those refuges, it's that Mount of Hermon, it's those times where God was faithful in your life that's going to remind you of what God has done, which will help you remember what God can do so that you know that what you face today, God will work in your life to bring you up out of it. From depression and anxiety and anger and struggle to hope and healing and joy in your life. That's what it looks like to go from frustration to faith. That's what it looks like to go through the process of lamenting to joy. That's what it looks like to go from hell on this earth to heaven for eternity. As Paul would say, this is the closest to hell that we're ever going to be. And as we're on this journey, we're walking towards delight. We're walking towards joy. But the process of lament is being honest with each other, crying day and night, uh, uh, sharing deep depression, sharing our struggle and anxiety with one another, finding somebody that you can walk with through it and endure these things through it so that your God will be close to you and near to you, but also his people will surround you. That's what it looks like to go from hell on earth to heaven for eternity to delight in your God. So I hope that you'll remember what God has done so that you know what God can do and believe what God will do. You, you finish this passage out, Psalm 43. Vindicate me, God, and champion my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from the deceitful and unjust person. For you are the God of my refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about in sorrow because of the enemy's oppression? Send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mount, to your dwelling place. Then I will come to the altar of God, to God my greatest joy. I will praise you with the lyre, God, my God, beginning and end, capstone, my God. He's the champion. He's the savior. He's the redeemer. But if you look right in the middle, it says you're the refuge. But then he says, why have you rejected me? So many of us struggle with the the question of why God. But here we are, right in the middle of a struggle. In the middle of history of Christianity, we get to see a little bit, a portion of time where a man, an individual, maybe a group of people, shared that their God, they loved Him, they believed in Him, they trusted Him, but they also questioned, where are you? 
And I appreciate this because it allows you to step into this moment and go, can I ask it too, Matt? And the answer is yes. You should. Today, you should be asking the question, when God, where God, how God, why God? But we always ask it with trust, with faith, with hope, knowing that God can, that has, and will. We ask these questions not out of spiting God or out of anger towards God or out of uh, blaming God, but rather out of trusting God. Because here's the truth. You know you're going to ask the question. The question is, who are you going to ask it to? Not if you're going to ask it. The question is, are you going to go to something in this world? The question is, are you going to go to someone in this world who's disconnected from the God who can do something? Or are you going to turn it to God and say, I'm tired of turning this to these things? Because remember, you can share it with the world, and you can try to give it to the world, but the world can't handle what you've got. And so it's time to shift it over to God and go, I know that you care, and I know that you can, and you will do something about this, God. And so we're, giving, we're literally giving it over to God. Again, you try to give your debt for your house over to somebody in this world, they're not going to do anything about it. We have to recognize who can do something about the situation that we're in. We've got to recognize what God can and will do in our life. And so I challenge you, like this, like the author, acknowledge who God is. Recognize your issue. Share it with your God. Trust your God in that moment. Give it completely over to Him. I got a couple really practical um, challenges for you. And it begins with knowing a couple different um, chapters in Psalms that also deal with lament. We're going to deal with a bunch of different chapters in Psalms, but obviously we're not going to be able to deal with all of them in the span of time that we're going to be um, engaging it. Um, But just here's a few. Psalm 109 94, 22, 102, 44, 69, and 27. Those are all chapters in the Psalms that deal with lament. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about how can you minister this to yourself and how can you minister this to others? Ministering God's Word. Allowing God's Word to minister, to take care, to hold and and do well with your soul and with your heart and your mind. That God would minister these passages to you. So here's, here's a few ways that you can do that. First, pray the Psalms with one another. Now I say with and over because there's a difference. When we're praying with one another is what we've, we've brought other people into the prayer. When we're praying over, it's us laying our hands on them and praying specifically over them passages in Scripture that they might hear these things. They're going to hear things like, in your prayer, you are my refuge, God. Be their refuge. You are my rock on our hope. Yet, God, we weep right now. We struggle. We mourn. But we believe in you, God. And you're going to hear direct quotes out of Psalms as you pray Psalms over one another. But as you pray with one another, what you're doing is you're inviting people, if, even, if it's God ministering His Word to you or you're ministering God's Word to, one, uh, to another, what you're doing is you're bringing them in and saying, I, I want you to just be praying with me in this. So when you're together, when you're separate, all those different things, you're bringing that passage up and praying it with one another, not just over one another. Third, memorize whole psalms because psalms are, they're, they're connected. Like the, the whole chapter oftentimes is connected. And what we do sometimes is we memorize one verse out of one book or one chapter out of psalms. And when we do that, what we miss is like, let me give you an example. Um, Psalm 34, 8, taste and see the Lord is good. But Psalm 34, 18 is the Lord is close to the broken heart and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 34, 1, same chapter, uh, I will praise the Lord at all times. His, soul, his praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Uh, those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Do you hear all that's happening right there? It's all just worship. Verses 1 through 5, worship. Verse 8, delight in God. And then verse uh, 18, he shifted to, my bones are broken. The enemies are oppressing me. They're attacking me. But the Lord cares for the broken heart and saves those who can crush the spirit. And you see like this thread of what God's doing. Same as uh, uh, chapter 42. 
where it begins with this is my living God. He's my refuge and my rock, but I'm deeply depressed and I'm crying. And so don't just memorize one verse. Though, I mean, memorize what you can memorize, but I challenge you to memorize whole chapters that you can pour that into someone that you're ministering to. That you can invest in them deeply in that way. Then fourth, sing the Psalms with Shane and Shane or Matt Papa. These are two examples of contemporary artists who've taken exact Psalms and sung them. They're singing these so that you can sing with them, participate in them with them. And so uh, there's others. I'm sure there's other great ones out there. Maybe you know that I don't know. I'd love to hear those. Email them to me. These are just two guys that I know that are doing it. And then finally, fifth, meditate on one psalm a day with the individual. So when you've memorized those, just bring people into it. Like, hey, will you meditate on this with me? You know somebody's going through some pain, heartache. Just meditate on this with me, this psalm, a specific psalm. And so that means at 12 o'clock, when they're struggling, you send them a text. Hey, look, I know, I know you're struggling today. I know this is what you're wrestling with. Um, just remember God's Word says this in the, in, the, in the book that we're reading, in the chapter that we're reading. Remember where it says that He's your refuge. Like, you can run to Him. It's okay to cry. It's okay to give it over to Him. It's okay to share it with other believers. Remember that as you go through this. That's at 12 o'clock, you know, 3 o'clock. Bring it back up. Remember, He's your rock. He's your strength. That means when you're feeling weak, He's, your, he's strong. Right? Now, before the band's going to come up, but in the process of lamenting, going from frustration to faith, going from depression and anxiety to joy and delight, in that process, there's, there's one danger I want to warn you of because many could say, well, Matt, it just sounds like you're just telling us to, to complain to God, to be asking, why God? But remember, lament becomes simple when it blames God for evil things in your life. When it blames God for something he didn't do. It's the difference between this. Israel in the wilderness, when they didn't have food and drink, what'd they do? They blamed God. They said, we're hungry and we're thirsty and it's because you want to kill us. That's the same God that brought them out of Egypt, led them through the Red Sea, now has them in the wilderness on the journey to Israel and they blame him for wanting to kill them. It's different than in the Psalms because in the Psalms what happens? They recognize their pain and suffering and yet they still praise God. So in the midst of your depression, in the midst of your anxiety, in the midst of your anger, would you turn it into praise, not into cursing? Don't curse God for what you struggle with, rather than praise God for being the God that can help you through the struggle. The evil you experience today was never intended for you. It's sin. It's caused by sin. It's evil that wrecks this world. It's havoc that the devil wants to rip you apart and rip your relationships, your marriages, your life, everything apart with this. So boldly stand up and lament to your God. It's not about just acting like it's rosy and everything's good and everything's fine. Lamenting's not that. Lamenting's not praising when it's easy. Lamenting's not just if you have a beautiful voice or can play an instrument. Lamenting is real. It's, it's frustrations being expressed. It's anger being expressed. It's you and your heart broken expressing it. And so my gospel response for you is this, this morning is this. Knowing that Christ did what we could never have done. He lived a perfect life. He died a death that we should have died by taking our imperfection and sin upon His shoulders. And He raised from the dead so that we can raise from the dead too. That one day God is going to take you and, and bring you into His presence for eternity. From hell on earth to heaven for eternity. The gospel is good and it can transform your life. I believe that it will transform your life, your marriages, your friendships, you personally, your sin struggles, your joy. It's going to transform what you find is joyful. And I hope God will transform that in your life today. And as you do, and if you have, I challenge you with this. What are you suffering with in this life that you have not lamented over to the Lord? I mean, share, give, it's gone. It's off your shoulders, you've given it over to the Lord. What are you, what are you suffering with? You've said... I've communicated this to God. I've communicated this to people, but I have not given it to God. And second, when you, when you recognize what that is, would you write out a lament? Go to the Psalm 109, 94, 22, 102, 44, 69, 27. Read through it. Study it. What does a lament look like? Remember what we've talked about today and write out your own laments. 
And it might sound like that. It might sound like, why God did you allow that relationship to be broken? Why God did you allow this family member to pass away? Why God did you let me experience this hell on earth, this pain, this disease? Why? Yet I'll still praise you. I still trust you. You're still my rock. You're still my refuge. I know you can. I know you have. And I know you will. Would you write out a lament? Be honest and raw. Be authentic and vulnerable. And finally, will you delight in what and who is good? When there's nothing else on this earth that you feel like you can delight in, would you delight in him? Recognize those things that he has done. Recognize those things that he has given you. Bring those things up to the forefront. Look at those trash cans and say, man, God, I, I thank you. Like, I'm still living today. Bring it up to the surface and say, God, I thank you. I delight in this. I see the hill around me, but I delight in God. I'm going to pray for you. We're going to worship. God, you are so good. We trust you. We pray, God, that you would take our struggles in a way that only you can. That you would give us a life that only you can. Give us the joy that only you can. Help us to find a healing in this earth, in this world that you've provided for us. Help us to find the healing that you provide. I pray, Father, you would help us to share things that we're struggling with honestly and vulnerably. Would you help us to weep when we need to weep? To be frustrated when we need to be frustrated. To cry out with questions when we need to cry out. I pray, God, that you would raise up mighty men and women in this room to support one another, to encourage one another, to talk about what you have done so that we know what you can and will do. I pray this in your son's name. Amen.
Amen, what a beautiful hymn. Uh, rem- I do have a quick quick announcement there. Uh, Medevac had to come in uh, on 97 right here. I'm praying, you know, everybody's okay for sure. I'm going to pray with you in, here in just a second. But just letting you know because uh, you can't exit out this way. Uh, you can take a right, but it's already backed up, as you can imagine. So my, what I would encourage you to do is just take a left out of the church. You can go down through the neighborhood and get back to uh, 140 it is over there. So I just go out that way. Let's pray real quick for this individual. I'm not sure who it is. Um, and then uh, remember you're sending this darkness light up. So let's pray. God, uh, would you be with this family? I pray, Father, you would provide peace and comfort. And I pray, Father, you would be the healer that you are, even as we think through this sermon, God, that you would give them um, more comfort than they could have imagined they would receive right now in this moment. And Father, if, uh, if necessary, God, would you intervene in a medical way that nobody knew you could do, but that you can do. I pray, God, that you would uh, give wisdom to the doctors and also give a, a expedient flight to the right hospital. So, God, we trust you with these things. We trust you with who it is. I pray, God, you would redeem their soul uh, and use it for a testimony for your glory. God, we love you in your son's name. Amen. We'll see you guys next week. You have any questions about the sermon or would like to know more about following after Jesus, uh, please contact us and we would love to talk more about your relationship with Christ and how you can grow in your spiritual journey.